yesterday was very much on the concept of that often we are our own worst enemy, which unfortunately is all too true, all too often. We don't do a good job protecting ourselves from ourselves. And we often spend so much of our time thinking the enemy is outside of us. It's the political party, it's the South African government, it's the rabbi, it's the community, it's the spouse, it's the child, it's the... We spend so much time worrying about things outside of us without realizing you, if anyone else, will decide the quality of your life. And every moment that we spend worrying about somebody else or something else is a moment of worry. Not only is it a waste of time, and not only is it counterproductive, but it's taking away from the, the true area of reflection. And it's something that I've said many times, but each day I'm becoming more and more convinced that we don't realize how much control we have over our own happiness over our own destiny, over our own decisions, over our own morality, over our own future. And we don't realize how much we're holding ourselves back from what could be the life we want. And it's only us that is holding ourselves back, nobody else. The mightiness of being human is also what makes it scary. The Talmud tells us that a human being is compared to angels in three ways and animals in three ways. Like animals, we eat, we sleep, sexuality, etc. And angels, intellectual, spirituality, inc incredible kindness. The human being is a paradox. Half animal, half angelic. And often we're very aware of how animalistic we are. You can't really avoid it. You have food, okay? You have some food in your hand. You're drinking water. You're going to sleep at night. You're taking a shower. Very basic needs. So we're very often reminded of our humanity. But rarely do we remember how powerful we are. And because we are so unaware of how powerful we are, we don't realize how much is within us to transform our lives. We don't realize what Hashem gave us. And more than that, if we realize we become scared of it, we don't realize how much control we have of our lives. If we did, we would spend so much less time thinking about excuses why our life has not lived the, be the way it should be. And we would spend so much more time living the life we could because it's within our power. I've shared this before, but I don't think I've ever shared it on a recording. So um, there's always a good time to be first. Sorry. Um, and that is, it's, although it's not true what I'm about to say, I believe it to be at least somewhat true. Sorry about this. Can't seem to get this camera to behave itself. Um, okay. That heaven is for the people who don't need excuses. Hell is for the people who don't have excuses. But then there is the people who have excuses. Where do they go to? Sorry, not sure why this is not working. Okay, um, heaven is for people that don't need excuses. Again, this is not true. It's my hypothesis. Heaven is for people who don't need excuses. Hell is for people who don't have excuses. So where do people who have excuses go to? And my argument is, even though I've never been there, or if I've been there, I don't recall, that 
there's a place that's not heaven, that's not hell. It's an intermediary. It has everything that heaven has, all the luxury, because you have excuses. But they have one thing. Wherever you look, there's a screen. The phone is always in front of you. And what the screen is playing all day, every day, is the life you would have had had you stopped looking for excuses and actually lived the life you were intended to live. And I imagine that the screams that come out of this room are louder than the ones that come from hell. Having excuses gets you to heaven. But then you have to confront the fact of why was I looking for excuses if I could have lived a better life. Imagine having to witness the life you could have lived had you stopped playing victim or stop. Had you realized that you're truly a malach, you're truly an angel, that you really can do incredible stuff. Because if we realize that, if we really appreciate the power we have, we could be such holy people. I'm not talking about being famous people. I'm saying we could be such refined people. So, like, you don't realize how much forgiveness you have within yourself. You don't realize your potential for spirituality, your potential for kindness your potential for empathy, your potential for being happy for somebody else, for beginning. We don't realize how much greatness we have. And again, I'm not saying greatness as in you could become a world leader. That's not the definition of greatness. For some of us, it is. In other words, for some of us, if that's our calling, then that's what we become. Greatness means greatness in character that right now, all we can think about is how far riddled we are. But we don't realize that Hashem has given us the ability to be so forgiving. And he's given us the ability to be so kind. And so generous. And so selfless. And so sweet. And so strong. And so resilient. And so wise. We don't realize how much we could stretch ourselves. We live in a little bubble of our reality thinking that that is our capacity. I know it's a bad example, but that's the, the example that comes to mind right now, so I'll share it, forgive it. One time, I, for whatever reason, I had to take an IQ test. I decided to, but not like the IQ test on the internet, to go to a real person who knows what they're doing and to give me a full-on IQ test. And no, I'm not going to share my IQ. My IQ. And what was mind-blowing in one specific area was how much I underestimated myself and how much ability I have that I never even dreamed I have. And suddenly, I discovered that, do you realize how much ability you have in this area? And just that knowledge allowed me to stretch myself to places that I never would have dared going because suddenly you realized I'm so much more capable than the narrative I allowed myself in that specific area of intelligence. It was a multifaceted test. It tests various areas of your, your intelligence, your emotional capacity, et cetera. And that was just a prime example of me of how I thought I'm living in this league. But truly, there was a whole different league that I could just walk into because I'm there. I just didn't acknowledge that I'm there, that I can understand and study and do things at that level, even though I've never been taken there before, but I can easily walk in because that's where my capabilities are. And that's when I realized, gosh, what do we do to ourselves? I'm the variable Dicka type. That's what we tell ourselves. How do you know? Because you've been variable before. Doesn't mean that's the type you are. You could very well stop being variable from tomorrow. 
I'm not the kindest person on the planet. You know, just that's not who I am. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a kind person. I'm a good person, but I'm not warm. Okay, because you were raised by, by not warm parents, but that doesn't mean you're not warm. Just allow yourself to feel warmth and you'll feel it. In other words, whether it's bad childhoods or bad decisions we made or circumstances or just the place we grew up, etc., walls are put up all around us in which the walls tell you this is who you are. And I'm not totally talking from a psychological point of view. I'm talking from a spiritual point of view. You know how holy you and I could be? And I'm not only saying holy as in keeping Shabbos kosher. I'm saying holy. My definition of a holy person is someone who never holds a grudge or hardly ever. Who never takes revenge. Who loves with all their heart. Who is happy for somebody else's simcha who's never jealous of somebody else's success, who feels empathy for somebody else's pain, not sympathy, they don't look down at them. They look at them with empathy and love. Who stretches their mind each day and is open to learn new things. Who realizes that relationships is so important and it's worth giving up of your own ego for the sake of the other. That is holy, and each and every one of us can be holy. Who controls their impulse, who does not let out an anger just because they feel angry, who doesn't allow their feelings to necessarily define their behavior, but is stronger than their feelings. And even when they feel sad, they don't necessarily act sad. And even when they feel angry, they don't act their anger. They deal with their feelings. They don't avoid it but they don't scream, they don't shout, they control themselves, they're measured, they're disciplined, they're focused, they're a mensch in every circumstance. They deal with challenges with grace and they deal with success with grace. They know how to give a compliment and they know how to receive a compliment. They know how to make people feel blessed to be in their presence and they know how to make other people feel that they feel blessed in their presence. They make people feel comfortable. They make people feel non-judged. This is all stuff that isn't frummy stuff. It's mensch stuff. It's human stuff. But that is greatness. That is a person who's great, whose character is refined. You know, some people you spend time with, I spent time with such an individual recently, an older woman, incredible person who's been through their own challenges. And you just spend time with them and you realize this person has been refined. Life has made them the best version of themselves possible, not only life, but their choices. Most of us are of a version of ourselves, a decent version. You know, most of the people, I look at the people on this group, we're all nice people, I'd like to believe. But when we, are we the ultimate version of ourselves? I'm not saying are we perfect. Are we a, a version of ourselves that is stretched, that is refined, that is worked through? You know, sometimes you really, you're making a dough or something, you really have to beat it, you have to beat the egg in order for it to really, you know, be what it needs to be. Sometimes, like, to be refined means to really, like, scrape it. You know, I'll give you an example. If you have to sand the table. First time you sand it, it's a rough sand and another sanding and another sanding. And eventually, you know, the final sanding of the table is a very delicate sanding, which basically it removes almost nothing. But it's the final refinement. In order to refine our character, we need it. We need to go through lots of sand things in life. Not only challenges from without, challenges from within. Lady, why did you act that way? What was the logic of that? Why didn't you control yourself? What could you have done better? How much of your character did you bring out to that moment? 
Did you live up to the standard that you should be expecting of yourself? Or did you fail yourself in a moment of weakness? How can you do better? How can you make sure next time that you don't say something you regret? That you don't gossip just for the sake of gossip? That you're kind and you're empathetic? That you allow the other person to feel without being judging of their feelings? You allow the person to be themselves. This refinement, this reflection, it's, it's, it's character building, but that's the only way. That's what it means to be an Oved Hashem, a servant of God. The word Oved, to serve, doesn't only mean to serve, it means to work through. For example, when the, the Tanya tells us when a tanner who's beating a uh, piece of leather into, from skin into leather, it's called ibud, to really work, to, to beat the living daylights out of that piece that turns it into beautiful leather. That's what it means to serve God. It means to not only just do the right thing, but to stretch yourself, to take a piece of skin and turn it into leather, to take a human being and turn it into an angel, to take a person who's full of ego and bring humility to them, to take a person who puts themselves at the center of the universe and to learn how to put something else, God, at the center of your universe. To realize that my, the other person's needs are sometimes more important than my own. That marriage is true compromise. This character building, this is what Judaism does. Judaism is there to make us refined people. If Judaism does not stretch us, if our, our faith in Hashem does not stretch us, we might be doing all the mitzvahs and we might get a beautiful part in heaven, but we have not allowed Yiddishkeit to do its job on us. I've seen people with beautiful marriages but the marriage hasn't stretched them. So they might look back and say, listen, I've been married for 40 years, I have a beautiful marriage. But it was a marriage of convenience or just that the personalities happened to fit or they just came to some you know, mutual truce. But for a marriage, not only to be great, but to be rich, we have to rub ourselves, we have to stretch. We have to allow that other person to take space out of your ego, ouch. But that's growth. You could raise a good child and the child didn't necessarily stretch you as much as you could. Often it's the difficult child who stretches you if you allow it to, if you don't resent them. If you allow the child to stretch you, that person that will make you, that sibling of yours, which is, sorry for the bloody impossible, can stretch you in a way that your lovely little sibling cannot. Stretching, that's what we're here to do. Not only physical stretching to make sure that your bones don't atrophy and that you don't you know, start aging too early. No, stretch your character. How do you know your day was productive and rich? That you felt this tug, you felt this, oh, I really want to explode on you, but I won't. I really want to resent you, but I won't. I really want to feel sorry for myself, but I won't. Or I'll try to do better next time. Stretching is hard, but that only when you stretch can you then exercise and build muscle. Only when you stretch yourself can growth truly happen. If everything we're doing is just convenient and comfortable, yeah, I have the same friends, I have a convenient relationship with my spouse and my children and my this and my that, and life is just cruise control. Then I haven't embraced the totality of, 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 of human experience.
I've always said this, that I believe the worst moment of life is the moment of death. The moment a person dies, not when you witness it. When, I, when a person dies, why? Because in one second they realize that everything they believed was actually true. <laughs> it wasn't just a belief. Like imagine the moment the person dies. Please God, it should only happen at the age of 180 for all of us. At that moment, poof, physical world's gone. Suddenly we're in a world of souls. Suddenly we see our deceased loved ones. Suddenly we see that the body is not everything. In one second, think about it, how quick that transition is. In one second, we go from a world where physical is reality to the place where physical is useless and meaningless and nothing. Why can't we have that moment a few years earlier? <laughs> In other words, let's be honest, even if you're not the biggest person of faith, you know that when a person dies, they don't exactly go to, a, to nothing. Something, they go somewhere. They are something. I've only met one person before that ever told me that they actually believe that when a person got, is gone, they're gone. People might struggle to articulate what heaven or hell or what a soul is, but it's not as if the moment the body, the, the soul leaves the body or whatever, the moment the person stops breathing, they no longer exist in any realm. Whatever realm they exist in, they are aware of something that you and I are not aware of yet. Or they are, don't know, sorry, we are aware of it, but now they see it. What till now was a philosophy class, what till now was the, you know, the rabbi trying to convince you is suddenly real. So real. Why can't we feel that earlier? Why do we have to discover how amazing we could have been once we can no longer be it? Once you die, you can't become anything you, want, you weren't before you died. You're at the level you die that for good. You're locked, locked in. We're told even when Mashiach comes, a person will not be able to truly stretch themselves. You are who you are and you're locked. You'll grow within that, but you can never truly grow exponentially ever again. Only in this world, in this crazy, pathetic, complicated world, can you become somebody magical. Stretch yourself. But most of us only discover how big we could have become once we could no longer become it. Some of us only discover our potential once our potential is taken away from us. Some of us only discover our genius once our genius will take us nowhere. Why? That's why we have Torah. That's why we have Shirim. That's why we have meditation. That we should not wait for that moment to discover who we were. The whole point is to discover it in this world, in this world that seems to tell us that we're not great, in this world that seems to tell us that there is no God, in this world that seems to tell us that our actions don't really matter. This is where the battle happens. That's why it counts here. It doesn't count after you die because at that moment you have clarity. And once you have clarity, the game is over. In other words, once Hashem removes the curtain and he calls the bluff, it's over, game over, sunshine. Okay, here it is, game over, okay now. You could see, you could watch the video, what could have been. Death is over. Yes, the people who die go to a better place. But you know what they will never have again? The ability to grow. And that's why Judaism cherishes life. Even though we don't see death at the end of anything, and we know that they go to a better place, we know that we're in no rush to get there. Because here is where growth happens, in this messy world. For the 80, 90, 100 years that we are blessed in this world, that's what matters. But God plays tricks on us. He puts us in a world that doesn't allow us to see our true potential, doesn't allow us to see him. So we start buying all of it. We start believing everything that the world tells us. 
And one day you discover how great you really were had you only just said, I'm great. One of the things that, you know, that's been really going around about Rabbi Sachs, he's been sharing the, a lot of thoughts of his have been going around the last few weeks ever since he passed. Is he says when, when he met the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Lubavitcher Rebbe told him he could be a leader, he didn't believe it. In other words, like, what do you mean? I'm not a leader. I plan on being an educated professional. And the Rebbe says, no, you could be a rabbi. Then the Rebbe says, you could be a chief rabbi. And he says, the Rebbe saw in me something I didn't see in myself. And that's the greatest miracle. The miracle is not when you make an infertile per- couple have a baby. That's a great miracle, but that's not the great. That's not what makes a person great. True mir- miracles when you when you help another human being discover that they are a miracle. If you spend time with a person and you walk out from that person knowing that you are more capable than you ever dreamed, that person just did a miracle on you because now you can become an entirely new version of yourself. Not pop psychology, not, oh, you're amazing, you're fantastic, rah, 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 go change the world. I can't stand all that stuff they tell uh, university graduates. You guys are the best thing. The world's been waiting for you. No, they're not. The world has not been waiting for the recent Yale, Harvard, Oxford graduates. We honestly have not been waiting a bunch of... um, snowflakes who don't know how to deal with life because they've been living in safe spaces. No, we haven't been waiting for you. Get into real life, get beaten up a bit, and then we'll, we'll wait for you because then you'll have something to teach us. But at a university, you have nothing really to teach us. So I'm not talking about pop psychology. Yeah, you're fantastic. No. You can be fantastic. Not you are fantastic. Like I always tell Barmy boys, you are not an adult. Sorry, my dear 13-year-old, you are so not an adult but you can now start the journey towards adulthood. And hopefully in 10, 15 years time, you'll be enough of an adult to allow space for another loved one in your life and have a good marriage and bring children into the world and make an impact in this world. But you are not an adult at 13. You are not a man. And my dear girl, you're not a lady at 12. You are so not. You might be young and vibrant and inspiring and we might even cry at your body, but you are not a woman. And my dear son, you are not a man. You are beginning the road to womanhood, to manhood. Because telling people you're great just for who you are, doesn't, that's not the point. You can be great if you stretch yourself. You have greatness within you that's waiting to be uncovered. Go work. Go get married and allow the other person to develop your greatness by beating you up, by telling you what a nobody you are. They will help you build. Have a child, have a teenager, an angry teenager. They will make you. Because if you are great without effort, it's nothing. How does the Talmud tell us? The Talmud says the following. Yagata umatsata, sorry, yagata velomatsata altame. If you made an effort and you did not find success, don't believe it. In other words, if somebody says, I, I put an effort, but I didn't find success, don't believe it. Lo yagati, I didn't make an effort, umatsati, and I had success, altame, don't believe it. Yagati, if I made an effort, umatsati, and I had incredible success, tame believe it. None of us are great just because we're great. We have the potential to be great if we put the effort in. And once we put the effort, wow. Wow. As I said, you could see in people, people who've really worked on their character, you could see in them like such refinement, such maturity, such holiness. This is a mensch. That's a mensch. They're not necessarily the, the great spiritual leaders. They don't carry titles. They might sit in the last row of the shoal. 
and you wouldn't even know their name. But look in their eyes, because a person can always be seen through their eyes. Look at their eyes, and you will see absolute holiness. May we all discover that within ourselves. May we all put the effort in. Because if we put the effort, we'll definitely see the reward.